Antony and Cleopatra, one of William Shakespeare's masterpieces. It was written in about 1606. This would have been for Shakespeare after Macbeth, but prior to Coriolanus. Uh, Shakespeare would have been in his 40s, early 40s. He'd been writing for the theater for about 17 years. In the folio of 1623, the first folio, the first publication of his works uh, altogether, seven years after his death, I believe, there are no act and scene divisions for the play. So when you're reading Antony and Cleopatra, all the act and scene divisions were edited in later by somebody else. The play is a dramatization of a tragic and celebrated love affair. As so often happens in Shakespeare's work, every gain in the play seems to become some kind of liability for the characters. I really don't see anything purely good or even purely evil to be found in the play, and what seems admirable in one context is, is shown to be ridiculous in another, or both at the same time. The work picks up where Julius Caesar leaves off and takes us play, um, from the historical era of about 40 to 30 BC over the course of about 10 years. It completes the narrative of the Roman Civil War and the final dis destruction of the Roman Republic. You know, I think it fascinates us as readers because it intertwines empire and sexuality. The understanding of empire kind of reemerges in the English Renaissance during a new era of Western expansion as Europe enters this path of you know, pretty much genuine global domination with an increasingly sort of radicalized and sexualized view of some of the subdued peoples uh, that they conquer across the planet. England, of course, specifically participating in that uh, to a grand extent. The whole the sun never sets on the British Empire idea. Uh, the play avoids soliloquy for the most part and inaugurates a final phase in Shakespeare's career in which tragic intensity seems to be sacrificed in favor of kind of a more broad social representation. Throughout, there seems to be this rhythm of thesis and antithesis uh, that's developed between Rome and in Egypt, between Antony and Cleopatra and Octavius Caesar, but no synthesis of the thesis and antithesis seems to be in sight. There are two doors uh, often used in the play, one for Rome, one for Egypt, or one for Antony, one for Octavius. There are two nations, there are two forces, there are two philosophies, two leaders, two paradigms at play here in the work. Now, when the play opens, the Republic is essentially dead. Uh, Octavius Caesar in the play, Octavian Caesar in uh, history, astutely conforms to the style of Republic, where Antony sometimes offends the traditional Roman sensibilities by dressing in the gaudy trappings of monarchy. I mean, gosh, the man once entered in a chariot pulled by lions, after all, right? Uh, nonetheless, their political conflicts concern not just rival systems of government, but simply the desires of two extremely ambitious men, each of whom wants absolute power. The independence of Egypt is at stake, but this seems to occur to no one except Cleopatra, uh, maybe even duplicitously at that point. The opening scene gives us this common view, this ordinary person's view of what has recently transpired. And right away at the outset, there is excess, there is paradox. Uh, an example being the bellows, which blows cool air to increase the heat of the fire. There's some paradox uh, in that uh, imagery there. Egyptian love in the work is militarized. Roman war is eroticized. There is no distinction between public and private for Antony and Cleopatra, our protagonists, because for them, nothing is private. Uh, of the five fabled elements, water, air, and fire are Cleopatra's. Earth is Antony's. He's a land general. Will, desire, infinity, and boundlessness are all a part of the world of Egypt. But terms like execution, confinement, limitation, and action are all associated with the politics of Rome. In Rome, the future is told by armies and policy, by Machiavellian manipulation and deception, by an artful show of strength. In Egypt, the future comes from entertaining soothsayers, fortune tellers, uh, truth tellers, literally. It's game for the soothsayer in some capacity, a riddle uh, that can be, of course, misinterpreted. Now, the soothsayer is kind of both a character, he has lines, an actor plays the role, but he also seems to be sort of an aspect of Antony's conscience or consciousness, warning him of dangers. He comprehends, but seems to resist internalizing. Though Shakespeare makes Antony and Cleopatra more sympathetic than they are in the original source in Plutarch, they remain 
in the play maddeningly self-absorbed and self-destruction. They ignore urgent business, they act impulsively, they bully underlings, they revel in vulgarity, they lie and, and betray each other, you could argue. Antony and Cleopatra, they ex impress us as exceptional people because we are conscious of their legendary status, which in the play they cultivate by the public extravagance of their lives. So too are they extravagant in the range and intensity of their feelings. They, like us, are feeling beings that think. Uh, they do end up having several children, including twins Sun and Moon. Uh, their expressions of love in the play are typically tied to the past, though, as memories. We are willing, though, to believe in their love because the violence of their frequent quarrels seems to testify to their you know, total absorption in each other. Antony and Cleopatra are larger than life because the future of the known world seems to depend on them and their activities. They see themselves this way, too, as is typical in their self-dramatizations, like when they dress as gods, sit on a throne of gold, and allot territories to their children. Antony and Cleopatra are conscious of and seek to perpetuate their legendary status while still being intimately human. Cleopatra remembers on the sudden it's her birthday. Antony whistles alone in the marketplace while everyone else has gone to gaze upon his queen. Antony and Cleopatra's motives remain opaque to others and the audience, and maybe even to some degree to themselves. Uh, and due to the lack of soliloquy, we can guess and are invited to guess at their motives, uh, why Antony flees in Actium, for example, the first battle, or why Cleopatra later negotiates with Caesar. But in the end, we're left merely with the framing commentary of Enobarbus and other minor figures. Uh, Domitus Enobarbus, uh, kind of the conflation of two characters historically. Um, Enobarbus meaning red-bearded, uh, Judas red hair, uh, gave up Jesus, you know, Barbus gives up on Antony at some point in the play. Perhaps there's a connection in Shakespeare's mind. Uh, Antony and Cle Cleopatra's costuming conveys both information, their king, uh, or excuse me, their, their power, their position, uh, as well as furthering the spectacle of two royals who claim to be descended from Hercules for Antony and Isis for Cleopatra. They cross-dress, and this either dangerously confuses gender roles, which would have been the Roman perspective, or overcomes a destructive oppositional binary, which would have been probably the Egyptian perspective. For Caesar, manliness is a repression of all that is female, and Antony has betrayed his Roman self, his own ideals, in becoming partners with a strumpet. Cleopatra, however, sees Antony as a man who has become one with herself, who has raised the bar even for her own ostentatiousness. Her lovers have conflicting ways of interpreting experiences and people. The whole play might be seen as a series of attempts by the characters to understand and assess each other and themselves. The play exposes the gradual disintegration of Antony as Roman hero, and similarly, Alexandria melts into Rome as the battlefield becomes Cleopatra's monument. The language of inundation in the play recalls the rise of the Nile Delta, which fertilizes the surrounding place, and Cleopatra herself, too, who is identified, of course, with Egypt throughout the play. Antony is shown to be limited intellectually and imaginatively. He's overshadowed by sharper intellects like Octavius and Cleopatra. He must decide between a chaste... Uh, he must decide between Octavius and... Um, and Cleopatra. He must decide between Octavia, who he's later wed to, Octavius' sister, and Cleopatra. He has to decide between the world and flesh, a chaste Roman wife and an exotic, passionate seductress. Antony revels in an impetuous and extravagant generosity and challenges Caesar to one-on-one Caesar -on -one combat, but Caesar's a bureaucrat of the future. Antony is a warrior of the past. Young Caesar's concerns are public and political, Antony's private and personal. Where Antony's brother and wife Fulvia attack Caesar, Caesar promises the universal time of peace is at hand. This anticipates the Pax Romana, uh, as well as Christ, both of which occurred during uh, Octavius slash Augustus Caesar's reign as peacemaker. Antony, you could argue, is a has-been, a general who has shirked his duty and abandoned his men, as he himself soon acknowledges. Octavius, fretting in Rome, feels the need of Antony's heroic strength to defeat the threat of young Pompey the pirate. Antony gives, disperses in gestures as fertile in its own way as the nature of Cleopatra and the overflowing Nile River Delta. 
Octavius gathers. He's relentless and pragmatic and uniting and ruling. Antony is a living legend in a world too efficient uh, to contain, to comprehend his style of heroism. It's a political and bureaucratic world now. But Antony is a warrior, a historical figure, a man of epic abilities, a representative of the older order of giants, a man who could regain his place in history, but who is presently lost in dotage. This, of course, is the Roman view. But in Cleopatra's eyes, Antony is mythic, Olympian, godlike, erotic. Caesar sees Antony as a figure pointing backwards, once glorious, now faded, losing his place in history. And Antony, I think, fears this may be true. Cleopatra sees him as a transcendent being, pointing eternally forward. Uh, a kind of metamorphosed deity, and thus a crowning success. This is, of course, a view Antony shares when he is with her, too. Psychomachia, this struggle for the soul, is Antony's conflict. Uh, it is uh, his harmarsha, harmarsha uh, his tragic flaw, if you, if you want to discuss that. He's torn between Roman and Egyptian paradigms. Antony's proxy marriage to Octavia, which was not uncommon for royalty in Shakespeare's time either, is sealed by a handshake between two gentlemen, Antony and Octavius. It's the merger of two large corporations. It's a business venture. Octavia and Antony's distant descendants end up including the historic Romers Caligula, Claudius, and Nero, two out of three uh, being considered mad and, and awful rulers, supposedly. Uh, in a mood of self-dramatization, Antony complains that Cleopatra is a shirt of Nisus to him. Uh, this refers to a, a story from mythology where this is an artifact given to Hercules' bride by a centaur who desires her. But unbeknownst to the bride, uh, the centaur gives her this shirt that's poisoned, and she gives it to Hercules, who wears it, is poisoned, and, and perishes. Uh, is there a connection between Antony and Cleopatra there? Antony seems to think so when he utters those lines, at least. So there are questions this play brings up. Can we have heroic action in a post-heroic world? How we view the place of values will determine how we view Antony, who stands at its center. Is he a failed hero? A successful myth? The battle scenes testify to the couple's belatedness, their near irrelevance. Shakespeare's uncharacteristic decision to follow the practice of classical theater and keep all fighting off stage leads only a feeling of being let down as helpless observers report on the debacle for us. Now, according to Plutarch, Cleopatra deliberately allows Caesar to discover she had kept her treasure to create the false impression that she hoped to survive. She expresses every possible emotion in the play, from uncontrollable rage to suicidal despair. Often, uh, both are similar uh, passions in the same sentence or the same moment, but she seems incapable of moderation of the Roman measure as all elevates for her to hyperbole. Antony, too, seems to adopt this Asiatic style, except with Octavia, as such extremes of emotion unite them and distinguish them from the Romans. Shakespeare, by the way, like Aristotle and Plutarch, thought style was an expression of character, conduct, and morality. It becomes challenging towards the end of the play to either celebrate ruthless Caesar's victory or to lament incompetent Antony's defeat. During Antony's Last Supper, he's criticized for moving his friends to tears, by Eno Barbus, the Judas-like figure by play's end. But unlike the protagonist's deaths in other Shakespearean plays, the death outcomes of our protagonists are desired by the audience. It's also a play of international politics where Antony and Octavius battle for mastery. Caesar ultimately wins because of the kind of peach pill each of these people are, and because of the irresistible power which Cleopatra exercises over Antony. This gives the relationship between the lovers a sense of unusual weight, intensity, and risk. The play is full of magic that seems to have Cleopatra at its source. She is somehow both ageless and timeless, as beautiful as ever now, a paradox of nature, a work of art. Her shortcomings are part of the paradox that makes her irresistible. Cleopatra's suicide may be seen as she wants us to see it, as a supreme and glorious sacrifice, or as an extreme act of self-indulgence. Her suicide act is a last and entirely characteristic attempt to display her extraordinary self, her arresting majesty. It is a final scene unlike anything else in Shakespeare. It's both a scene of absolute defeat for a mortal queen, but also the beginning of eternity for immortal lovers. When Caesar sees defeat, Cleopatra sees apotheosis. 
Since the folio lacks stage directions, it may be Antony, she takes to her breast. Uh, like a mother comforting her son, oh, Antony is, after all, a uh, cry of orgasm, too. In death, Rome and Egypt, Antony and Cleopatra, martial valor and sexual ecstasy are united in love. Antony and Cleopatra are a pair of splendid dinosaurs, outlasting the world for which they were made. Caesar's own problem is that he is haunted by the past, haunted by a world too great, a canvas too large for him to fully dominate it or master it. He is haunted by the myths of the past, and he must eliminate its last two living remnants. Sexual and Oedipal jealousy may underlie Caesar's excessive demonstrations of peak and umbrage when Octavia returns to him with a small train in attendance, for example. Consider, too, his false promises of honor and consideration to take Cleopatra captive and lead her in triumph. She will be his Cleopatra then, not Julius's, Pompey's, or Antony's, since he cannot rival the, the legend of their lies. Caesar will humiliate them and end the legend.